Hey everybody, it's Fred. Thanks for joining me in my dining room for a lecture on firing, our last lecture for the semester. Um, it, this is also available as a PowerPoint in the Blackboard site, but I wanted to um, be able to talk to you and um, go through the PowerPoint, go through the lecture and add some more detail to what's there. Remember that um, this information is, is going to be, some of this information is going to be on the take home exam, the, the exam that's up on Blackboard right now, the technical exam, I should say. So it's there, you should be getting in there. You can go in as many times as you want, answer the questions, and then you just need to submit it by uh, our final critique meeting on Friday, uh, the 15th. So I'm gonna start the presentation now. And um, uh, if you have any questions, at any point after you watch the video, you can send me an email. I've been on email a lot in the last few days and um, just uh, feel free to contact me again. So here we go. So this, so this lecture is about firing and one of the things we've missed uh, because of what's happened is the wood kiln firing in um, this is the first time we've had a semester where we didn't get to do this. Um, obviously, it's a problem with what's happening, uh, and we don't really have any options as far as being able to fire the wood kiln at this point and into the summer, too. So this lecture basically covers um, kilns, firing ceramics, and basic information that you should know um, going forward. So um, what I'm going to show is a bunch of different kiln types and uh, including, this is the, the big wood kiln that we have outside. Um, it's called an anagawa, which is uh, a Japanese word for um, hole or bank kiln that was designed to go up a hillside. And this one um, we built in 2003, um, usually fired in the summer, um, of course, except for this summer. And you can see the flame shooting out the top of the chimney. So with this kiln, we go um, from whatever temperature it is outside up to over 2300 degrees just with um, firewood. Um, when we're talking about temperature, one of the most important things that most ceramic artists uh, talk about is the idea of a cone. They don't say a specific temperature that you fire to. Um, the cone is a specifically um, a special made material that's designed to melt and bend at, um, at temperatures. And all this is based on industry. Ceramic artists have to deal with the fact that there's industrial scale materials and kilns and uses that we don't really get into, but we just use the materials that they've already come up with. So cones have been used for a long time. They were designed by um, ceramic manufacturers and it's a good system for us to use, um, but you'll see in the cone scale, there's some kind of weird quirks as far as um, how cones work and they do physically kind of get flexible and they tip over almost like dominoes. And you can see in the picture, um, it's a picture of somebody looking inside a kiln as the heat is rising in the kiln and the, the cone that's kind of tipped over that cone in that particular firing, they had reached that temperature already. And so you can see, you can actually watch them doing that while you're firing in any kiln. So this is a cone scale and um, I hope that you can see the, I'm gonna magnify this a little bit so you can see the text maybe a little bit easier. So this is a cone scale, just with some examples. It's not the entire cone scale. What I've seen is cones all the way from uh, 022 all the way to like cone 16. Um, industry uses some higher temperature cones sometimes. Um, and I'm just, there's some examples in there of common temperatures that you might see uh, as a ceramic artist, but you don't see every single one on the scale. The way this works is you can see that cone 012 corresponds to 1607 Fahrenheit um, and cone 12 corresponds to 2435 Fahrenheit. So there is no zero cone. And what you're looking at is all Fahrenheit degrees. Um, and as you get closer to zero, um, you know, you see you have 022, so you have O12 um, is colder in temperature than O6. So I think about the O as kind of a negative sign. 
Um, so like cone 01 is 2090 Fahrenheit and cone 1 is 2120 Fahrenheit. So those are important because when you're working in your own studio and you're buying materials um, from a manufacturer, which most people do, you need to make sure that the, the cone temperatures that you're firing to on your materials are correct. So if you bought clay that was designed to be fired to cone 6 and you fire it to cone 06, it doesn't really work. Um, and vice versa. So if you bought earthenware that's designed to fire to 06 and you fired it to cone 6, that's going to be a disaster. The piece will actually melt and turn into a puddle. So you want to avoid that. Um, then if we look at uh, main categories for temperature, so if you're looking for books and magazines or ideas or websites about, um, say, low-fire ceramics, that's usually going to be somebody working with earthenware clay, generally fired to cone 06 to 02. Um, and I do a, do some of that in our electric kilns um, in the studio. We're we're using mid range material, so we're using a stonework clay, uh, and we're firing to cone, glaze to cone six. Um, so cone six again is twenty two forty five Fahrenheit, um, and that's where the glaze is fully melted. Um, and then when we fire the wood kilns outside, that's when we're hitting cone eight to fourteen, um, usually right around cone ten, which is again twenty three eighty one. Um, and then we're using stoneware and porcelain. So the main point is that you just need to understand how the temperature degrees kind of move across the scale and why it's important um, that you don't mix them up like 06 and cone 6. Cone 06 and cone 6 are really critically different temperatures. Um, so if you ever made that mistake, you'd have some trouble. I'm going to zoom back out a little bit so you can see all of this. Um, so bisque firing is our first firing. And the point of doing a bisque firing, and you remember that's the pink material, the first firing is to make the pieces easier to handle and decorate. It also burns out any organic material in the clay that might cause problems. So like if there's any carbon in the clay, if you didn't bisque fire, it could kind of make um, bubbles in the glaze. So we want to avoid that. Bisque firings are almost always done in electric kilns and they're fired between cone 010 and 04. Um, electric kilns are very easy to control temperature wise. We are, ours are uh, computer controlled. So it's heating at a very specific rate um, and can hold at temperatures, makes it really nice. So almost everybody that bisque fires will do that in electric kiln. Um, it's just so much easier. And electric kilns are the cheapest and kind of easiest to accommodate in any studio. Um, in a bisque firing, you can include any clay body. So if I had in the studio, if there were people using earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain, we could do all of those clay bodies in one bisque firing without a problem. Finish or glaze firing is where it gets more challenging. So if um, you are working with earthenware, you're going to fire your glazes usually to about cone 04. If you are working with porcelain, you're going to go to cone 10. So those are very different. So um, you know, if you had a piece of earthenware accidentally put in a cone 10 firing, the earthenware clay itself would turn into a black puddle, um, which I've seen happen and it's not good. Um, and vice versa, if I have a, a, a porcelain piece with a cone 10 glaze on it and we put it in an earthenware kiln, the glaze wouldn't melt at all. It would be this really dry chalky surface. So you got to make sure that you keep those separate and you know what temperature everything is supposed to be fired to. The next more complicating issue is there's atmospheres inside the glaze firing and um, I'm going to talk about those next oxidation and reduction. So these are really important concepts and how pieces are fired and how they're finished. So um, in an oxidation firing, what you're basically having happen is your normal kind of atmosphere that you're breathing. Um, it just there's an excess of oxygen in the scope of the atmosphere. Um, and this can be done in electric or fuel burning kilns. So we could do oxidation firing in our wood kiln. It's not something that we usually would want to do, but um, it is possible. Um, electric kilns are only able to fire in oxidation. Um, and so that's kind of our go-to with the cone six firing. So we're doing cone six oxidation. And what happens is the, the atmosphere actually affects the color of the clay and the glazes. So if you had your um, our regular class clay 
you remember that kind of after they were glaze fired, the bottoms were kind of that whitish um, color. Uh, and you'll see how it, it would change in reduction um, in a minute. So, for example, in oxidation glazes that might have a small amount of copper are usually green. If there's a small amount of iron, they're usually yellow. And then if they're cobalt, have if they have cobalt in the glaze, they're blue. There are exceptions to all these rules, of course, and we learned some of those in ceramics too in the glaze composition area. And then reduction is a more complicated um, atmosphere to understand and to deal with. So in reduction, there's a chemical reaction um, that's created by a reduced amount of oxygen. And this causes a physical change in the chemistry of the clays and glazes. So in this case, if you had a small amount of copper in your glaze, there's a good chance it's gonna turn reddish as opposed to green. A small amount of iron is gonna turn green instead of yellow. Co uh, cobalt almost always creates blue colors with some exceptions. Um, and then if you had uh, your clay, so that white clay that we were using this semester, if we fired that in the wood kiln, it would be this really rich kind of toasty brown color, um, which would look very different than what you had seen in the electric kilns. Um, the reduction atmosphere, the way you create that is by, if it's a gas, say a gas fired kiln, you would just turn up the gas pressure. If it's a wood fired kiln, you just add extra wood fuel, um, or you could also, um, move the chimney dampers in. So every kiln that has a chimney has a set of dampers. There's slides that move in and out and that helps control the atmosphere inside the kiln. Um, and, and there are real subtle changes and can be difficult to um, figure out when you first start firing a kiln. But as you get more experience, it gets easier. And so what I wanna do next um, is get into some of the alternative firing types that we don't have access to all of these. Um, again, just this semester you had access to um, the electric kilns, which um, is the most common firing type, I would say probably in, right now in the, in the United States. Um, cell firing is something that's been around for a while. This was uh, developed in Ger or somewhere in Germany kind of in the Middle Ages. And they, the, the theory is this was figured out by accident. Um, people were wood firing their pots and they ran out of firewood. And so what they did was they broke up um, barrels that had been used to store um, uh, salty food. And so the salt was kind of in the wood. And so when they fired the kiln, they used the wood. And then after the kiln was unloaded, they realized, realized that something was different. And so the thing that was different was the surface of the clay actually got glazed. And when the salt goes into the kiln, and the way you do this most often is you just take like rock salt and you kind of pour it into a big piece of newspaper and you roll it up into kind of a burrito shape and you throw that into the kiln. So right around 2200 degrees, you throw that in there and it explodes and turns into a sodium vapor. And that vapor will float around inside the kiln and actually combine with the silica in the clay to create a glaze. So remember, silica is naturally in the clay and that creates a glazed surface. And so what you're seeing on this image is um, that uh, kind of brownish area, the color is just the clay by itself. There's no any nothing else added to that. Um, there is... Um, a black slip. So it's a black layer of clay that's been put on the surface and there's a green glaze on the inside. Soda firing is a very similar um, concept to salt firing. It um, was developed in the 1970s, actually at Alfred University, um, about an hour west of us. Um, and it was about, there was con uh, concerns about salt firing pollution. And so a graduate student at Alfred developed the materials to do soda firing. Um, instead of using just regular salt, you use uh, something called soda ash or borax. And these are kind of, um, they have different compositions chemically, but there's a very similar idea. And so that material goes into the kiln and it turns into a vapor. And then that vapor combines with the clay to create the surface. And so on this teapot form, the black is, um, is a uh, slip. And then the, um, kind of peachy color is the clay itself, which is porcelain interacting with the soda vapor. So wood firing um, is our next uh, 
um, kind of alternative firing method. So in this case, wood is the fuel that helps to create, um, is the fuel that heats the kiln itself, but then it also patterns the surface of the pieces. So flying ash coming off the burning wood will land on the clay. And when it gets hot enough, it turns into a, a glaze. It gets really glassy and it can move if there's enough of it. Um, and so the, the idea here was people were firing ceramics and they saw this happen um, naturally on the pieces just from the results of the heating process. And so over time they figured out what was happening and they actually created glazes out of that. And that's what, again, ceramics too gets into. Um, up until the industrial revolution, um, almost all ceramics you might see and um, they were made, but you might see in museums were wood fired in different ways. So in this cup on the slide, it, um, the kind of glassy side on the left is uh, all ash glaze. And then that, um, what looks like kind of like an orange comet is, um, is the result of the flashing, which means the flame is moving around the piece and interacting with the clay in a very fluid way. So now we're gonna move into um, Raku, which is a low fire process that's originally developed in Japan. And what happens with Raku is you have a small kiln and you heat up the pieces. Um, they have a, usually have a glaze on them or some kind of um, slip or some material on the surface for decoration. Once the pieces are hot enough, you reach inside the kiln, grab them out with metal tongs, and then you, um, in, J in Japanese raku, you would just set them off to the side and they would cool down on their own. In Western raku, um, they're actually placed in a, uh, usually a metal container with some combustible material and that starts to smolder and the lid is put on and that really changes the surface of the clay and the glazes. And so you get these real again, organic kind of flashing patterns on things. Um, it's more dramatic. The thing with Raku is that it's a lower temperature process. The pieces are not 100% um, waterproof. So, um, you know, you couldn't have a Raku vase and put fresh flowers and water in it. It would eventually kind of leak out. We're getting close to the end here. So pit firing and Sager firing are, um, Pit firing was the original kiln technology. So ceramics were usually fired uh, sometimes on a bonfire. So they were just stacked up and then wood was placed on top and they were burned. Um, it was burned. And then a pit firing is just digging a hole in the ground and putting the ceramics down in there, kind of the same idea. And so kilns kind of came out of this concept. That's where they evolved out of. Um, in Sager firing, what you're doing is um, instead of having a big bonfire, say outside, with wood and, and burnable materials. Um, you do that inside a kiln. So you have a ceramic box and that's what a Sager is called. Um, uh, or a ceramic box is a Sager that's put inside a kiln. Um, and the Sager goes and is heated up with the burnable material and the ceramics inside the Sager, everything burns and the, the pots are patterned by the burning materials. Again, this is a low temperature process and the pieces are not um, glazed usually so, and they're not um, fired hot enough to be um, vitreous, which means they're, they're still um, porous and they will leak water. So again, a more decorative um, technique and process. Um, and then our last firing process that I want to talk about is um, the luster process. So this is where um, you can you can see that you can fire a piece multiple times. So usually the pieces are fired to a high temperature first, um, you know, at least cone six, usually to cone 10, um, and then they're cooled off and taken out of the kiln. And then this um, liquid solution, which has precious metal flakes suspended and it is painted onto the glaze that's dried. And then the piece is fired again to a really low temperature for ceramics, which is right around a thousand degrees. The gold or the silver or the platinum is then fused to the glaze surface. Um, and it's a very decorative technique. A lot of times you'll see this on really fine china or tableware. Um, it is real metal on the glaze surface. And so you, um, it, it's food safe because gold is food safe, um, but it's not microwave safe because it is metal. So that's a problem. So that's my last slide. Um, I, wanted, I want you to remember that 
that lecture is um, available on the uh, Blackboard site. Um, also, a lot of those questions that you would have to answer, all of this information is also in the studio handbook. So if you need to review anything, it's there. Um, it, uh, if you, again, if you have questions, please um, email me and I'll get, try to get back to you right away. Um, I'm also planning on having a final critique meeting, which would be on the Friday next week. And I'll be sending an invitation, an email invitation um, to do a video chat on Google Meet, which is how I'm recording this lecture. Um, and that won't be recorded, um, but it'll be a way, if you, can, if you can join everybody, it would be great for us to have one more meeting um, and you can show us your dining room or wherever you're gonna um, video chat from. So you can see over my one shoulder is um, a painting of Barney Fife from our friend Dan Reedy, who used to teach this painting at CCC, is now in Alabama. And over my other shoulder are three pieces of mine. Um, and these have been in all the meetings and things that I've been doing um, online. So again, I hope everybody's doing great. Um, staying safe, staying home, uh, doing the projects that you can. Uh, and I'll be in touch later as we start to figure out how we're gonna get the projects finished and fired. So please don't, um, just hold on to those pieces, don't let them go. Keep your pets away from them. Hopefully they're not getting broken and they will get fired at some point. So I'm gonna stop the lecture now and um, hope everybody's doing great. Thanks, bye.